So our first speaker tonight is Diane Sayer. And she's a leader of Lyndon LaRouche's slate of six congressional candidates who are leading the fight in the nation now to revive this policy of Glass-Steagall and to make this crucial turnabout happen. So Diane, please welcome me. Please welcome Diane. All right. Um, well, some people today might say, what on earth is the relevance of Alexander Hamilton? Just like when a number of us confronted Governor Chris Christie on the question of Glass-Steagall and FDR, and he said, oh, everything's totally different now. You know, the, the one thing has nothing to do with the other. And of course, the question of history is the study of principles, as is the question of science. A so-called fact is changeable, but a principle is, is universal. For example, if human beings don't have food and water, you have the same result today as you would have had 300 years ago. So I wanted to situate the presentations today in terms of what's, what's happening in Patterson and what's happening in the United States. And as some people in this room are aware, Patterson has been dealing with a uh, budget shortfall of $77 million out of a total budget of $184 million. And the governor refused to meet with either the mayor or the president of the city council. He finally gave the city $28 million, which is $6 million less than they'd gotten previously. And then it was up to the city to figure out how they were going to close this gigantic gap. So what was done was they decided to, they were generously given a waiver on the 2% property tax increase. So they raised the property taxes by 29% for two quarters. And uh, coupled with that, because just doing that wasn't enough to cut the gap, what they then did was they fired uh, one quarter of the city's employees, including 125 police officers. And to give you a sense of the desperation in this once prosperous industrial city, at the city council meeting the other night, one of the things that came up is because thanks to the trillions upon trillions of dollars of hyperinflationary quantitative easing and the lack of regulations on speculation and commodities, you have hyperinflation in everything, including metals. So one of the things that's occurring in the city is that homes which are vacant are just being gutted. So someone will buy a home, go to the home, and there's no wiring, no plumbing, nothing. It's all been taken out. And in fact, people are even stealing the guardrails, apparently, to go turn them in and sell them for the value of the aluminum. Now, this is not unique, unfortunately, to the United States. If you look at what's happening in the nation as a whole, you have, uh, combined with a breakdown of infrastructure generally, you have catastrophic weather conditions, which we'll be talking about the causes of that more in the Hasbrook Heights meeting on June 4th. But um, so look at Memphis, Tennessee. Half this place is now underwater. Uh, you have floods in the south all the way down to Louisiana. Uh, you had Katrina hitting Louisiana when Bush was president, who wasn't that interested. People may remember he wasn't interested in getting off the ranch and doing anything about it. And apparently now people are being fined $800 a month if they haven't moved out of the temporary trailers that they were moved into after Katrina. Um, then you had the British petroleum oil spill. Similarly, President Obama didn't see fit to interfere with a private corporation with a criminal record. Uh, and this state is now being told with the floods currently that they're going to have to come up with 25% of the money for the relief. So even though you have, I think in the country as a whole, or that part of the country, Louisiana, 22 parishes have been declared um, you know, emergency areas or federal disaster areas. There's 200 and something counties overall. But the federal government is saying that the states are going to have to pick up 25% of the tab. And these are states that have been devastated. So 
The question is, if we look back at our Constitution and the genius of Founding Fathers, and particularly the genius of Alexander Hamilton, there is a way to address this. Yes, go ahead. So, here we are. <laughs> Um, it's a dollar. <laughs> Maybe not worth as much as it used to be. Um, but let's, since I said I was going to talk about the question of how do you determine economic value. Well, let's take one example. People saw this morning, hopefully, that Mark Kelly took off in the shuttle and you have a bunch of astronauts up there. Now, um, what value is a dollar bill if you're up in the shuttle? You could order a pizza. Oh, they can't deliver it. Um, can you eat it? Does it supply oxygen? No. Uh, somehow this piece of paper, if you're up in the shuttle, has no intrinsic value. There's absolutely nothing you can do with it. Now how about here in the present? I suppose I could offer someone here in the room a dollar and you might, and I could get a cigarette. So I could have a, a dollar for a cigarette, and that would be, you know, it's worth a cigarette. Uh, and I have gained the value of being a millimeter closer to getting lung cancer. But once the cigarette is gone, the dollar is gone, and that's the end of it. Now, the third scenario is suppose that I decide to use this dollar and set up a bank. And I'm actually going to lend the dollar to Joe Farmer, uh, who agrees that he's going to repay me with small, a small amount of interest. He's going to repay me a dollar and two cents the next year. And what Joe Farmer does with the dollar is he goes out and he buys a packet of tomato seeds. And he grows, he has a fantastic season, and 90 of these seeds grow, and he ends up producing 30 bushels of tomatoes, and they sell the bushel for five dollars each. So now, this dollar, which I lent, has suddenly become $150 worth of tomatoes. And Joe Farmer decides that he's actually going to redeposit $100 of it. He's going to pay me the dollar and two cents. And then he's going to deposit $100 in my bank. And if I'm a super conservative banker, unlike any of the ones that we have today, <laughs> then maybe I would lend out $50 to other people who need loans. And, um, and there you have something very interesting, which has occurred with this dollar in the form of not what it is in the present, but what it is in the future. And you can say, so what is the dollar worth? Do you say it's worth a dollar and two cents? Or do you say it's worth one-fifth of a bushel of tomatoes? And, and you can see that trying to define it in mathematical terms gets quite silly. Um, so I wanted to share, because this gave me a certain insight on a difficult quote from Mr. Lyndon LaRouche when he was describing Hamilton's conception of a credit system. The presumption is that the usefulness of the output of production as measured in terms of the consumption which is temporarily withheld in the name of physically efficient credit can be foreseen with a sufficiently good approximation that the net result as measured in terms of physical usefulness is greater than the amount of consumption which is postponed in the name of credit. So if you say the dollar is, the dollar is worth a fifth of a bushel of tomatoes initially because that's what it is, you can see that by postponing Postponing that, investing it, and getting a future gain, you actually get 30 bushels of tomatoes. So by using this as an instrument of credit, by postponing the consumption of your dollar, you end up actually multiplying the, the so-called wealth. <clears throat> now, this begins to give you an insight into the genius of what Hamilton did when we had just had the American Revolution and our republic was enormously indebted and the debt was not equally shared. Some states had participated greatly and had massively indebted themselves. Some states had not participated that much and had very little debt. And what Hamilton did is he said, I, he said, I think the federal government should absorb all the debt of all the states. 
Now try and imagine any government saying that today. He yeah. said, <laughs> said, we're going to take all the debt. Because he knew the British still had an army on American soil. They were picking at us. They wanted to divide the states. They wanted to exploit the differences. So anything that could be used to pit a state against the other, um, they were going to use. And Hamilton wanted the republic to be successful. And he knew that by consolidating the debt, that he could take this massive debt and work out an arrangement with our European allies, the people to whom we owed the money, that we would pay them the debt with a small amount of interest, but we could use that, in effect, as an instrument of credit. And to do what? To build roads, to, to you know, uh, farm the land, to expand the productive powers of the new republic, and it would cement the states together so that the Union um, could not be destroyed. And Hamilton wrote, you can go to the next slide, a very um, excellent paper called The Report on Public Credit, where he discusses how necessary it is, this is in 1790, to, to have good credit and also the usefulness of it. You, you hear all this all the time. We should have no debt. We should have no debt. There should be no government spending. No debt, no debt. Debt is evil. Well, he says that exigencies are to be expected to occur in the affairs of nations in which there will be a necessity for borrowing. That loans in times of public danger, especially from foreign war, are found an indispensable resource even to the wealthiest of them. And that in a country which, like this, is possessed of little active wealth, I mean, this is a new country that just barely got through a war, or in other words, little moneyed capital, the necessity for that resource must, in such emergencies, be proportionately urgent. Go to the next. And then he talks about the reasons for doing this, to justify and preserve their confidence, to promote the increasing respectability of the American name, to answer the calls of justice, to restore landed property to its due value, to furnish new resources both to agriculture and commerce, to cement more closely the union of the states, to add their security against foreign attack, to establish public order, on the basis of an upright and liberal policy. These are the great and invaluable ends to be secured by a proper and adequate provision at the present period for support of public credit. Now think about what he says in relation to what the city of Patterson just did. And, and cities are jammed because cities, the law is you have to balance the budget. A city can't issue credit, can't issue currency. A state can't issue credit. So the city rips itself to shreds, like we've seen with Newark, where they now have a 70% increase in homicides. So the city is ripped to shreds because we're not, we can't have the debt. You can't have the indebtedness. And you begin to get a sense that something rotten is occurring. Um, so the, the question you can see is the whole idea of credit, the idea of currency, the idea of the bank, is the conception of the future. That's the idea that he's thinking of. That's what gives the currency its value. And here's another thing to think about, because everyone's heard of, of people who are buying gold. Buy gold, buy silver, it's inflating. You'll get more dollars if you have gold. OK, great, we can have zillions of dollars. We can have trillions of dollars. We can have gold coins. Can you eat a gold coin? Can you pile up the silver? I mean, maybe if you had a lot of silver, you could pile it up and you could use it as a bunker when people came to steal your canned food or something. <laughs> but in other words, these things have been determined arbitrarily to have value, but they don't. They're, it's just a way that people have used to measure something. They don't have intrinsic value. So the question is, what, what is wealth? And what creates wealth? We decided that dollar bill doesn't have any intrinsic value in gold. And I mean, it, you know, it feels nice. You like to hold gold. <laughs> it feels good. You can make jewelry or something. But um, the actual decisive factor is more. And it's not tomato seeds. <laughs> it's the question of the human mind. 
that you could take that packet of tomato seeds, you could dump them in the ocean or you could dump them in a Walmart parking lot and chances are nothing's going to occur. But because you have a human being who has an, an idea, a creative idea of how this seed can produce food, then what happens is his creativity is able to generate uh, wealth. And the question is, then how do you, what's the dollar value on the creativity of the farmer? Is there a dollar value for that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so what Hamilton understood is, is this principle very, very clearly. He understood very clearly, and you think about the whole um, framing of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. The, the whole concept is I mean, what is freedom? The freedom to do what? It's the freedom to develop your creative potential as, as a human being, as other than a beast, other than an animal. And because of this, Hamilton, Ben Franklin, the key founders of the Republic, were vehemently opposed to slavery because slavery was completely destructive of, of that end. And this is what Hamilton said about slavery. This is a paper he wrote in 1774, where he was like 19 or 17, depending on when you think he was born. Right. Um, so he was either 17 or 19 years old, and he's writing uh, this paper. I might need more chairs. I want to put some more chairs on. Um, in defense of a decision of the Congress to act against the very, very harsh taxes being imposed by Great Britain. And uh, there's alleged, an alleged farmer, it's probably some kind of Tory operation, who tries to organize against the Continental Congress and against the anti-British taxation sentiments. So what Hamilton writes in this paper, among other things, is uh, were not the disadvantages of slavery too obvious to stand in need of enumeration, in need of it, I might enumerate and describe the tedious train of calamities inseparable from it. I might show that it is fatal to religion and morality, that it tends to debase the mind and corrupt its noblest springs of action. I might show that it relaxes the sinews of industry clips the wings of commerce and introduces misery and indigence in every shape. The page of history is replete with instances that loudly warn us, beware of slavery. And then later uh, in 1791, in his paper on the subject of manufactures, he is even more sharp on the question of the human mind and also the superiority because people are saying, why don't we just be an agricultural power? Why don't we just go with farming? There's all this land, we can produce food, that's productive. And he says, no, there's, there's something higher in manufacturing and science and industry. And so he says, as you can see here, um, the purpose of this, to cherish and stimulate the activity of the human mind by multiplying the objects of enterprise is not among the least considerable of the expedients by which the wealth of a nation may be promoted. Even things in themselves, not positively advantageous, sometimes become so by their tendency to provoke exertion, like maybe our governor. Every new scene which is open to the busy nature of man to rouse and exert itself is the addition of new energy to the general stock of effort. And then, you can go to the next slide. He goes through what, what happens when you have a manufacturing economy. You get a division of labor, an extension of the use of machinery, additional employment to people who were not engaged in it before, the promoting of immigration. We wanted more people to come to our nation. We needed them. Uh, the furnishing greater scope for diversity of talents and dispositions which discriminate men from each other, the affording of a more ample field and various field for enterprise, 
the creating in some instances a new and securing in all a more certain and steady demand for the surplus of the products. So in other words, you're gonna increase the consumption of food and you're gonna increase the production of agriculture by investing in industry and manufacturing. I said each of these circumstances has a considerable influence upon the total mass of industrious effort in a community. Together they add to it a degree of energy and effect which are not easily conceived. Some comments upon each of them in the order which they have been suited may serve well to explain their importance, and he goes on. So you can see his <coughs> thinking, and, and this is the natural development of human economy, is that what is natural is to be able to, um, to use more energy, what's called energy flux density. You want to invest a greater amount of energy in a smaller area so that you increase production and that you have a growing population and that the standard of living of your growing population actually improves from one generation to the next, which is something people used to believe in this country. And now we're told that actually, you know, the future generations will have it worse and they should expect to have it worse and there should be less of them. And, uh, and they should consume less, and so on. Um, now, the last time the United States actually had an economic initiative based on Hamilton's thinking was under President John F. Kennedy. And it was the launching of the space program where you, uh, just certain things, and I hate using figures because all of this is so much beyond statistics and numbers are really stupid, but um, NASA at its peak employed I think 36,000 or 39,000 people, but you had 400,000 other individuals employed in the private sector who were producing components that were relevant um, for the, the moon launch. And then everyone, of course, have heard, why were they wasting all that money on the moon when we have starvation on Earth? Well, was Elvis Presley you know, running a bank on the moon? Where was all this money spent? We didn't spend any money on the moon. As far as I know, no one left any money on the moon. The money was spent in the United States employing the people and to use another stupid, as I said, I don't like to put it in this in monetary terms because it doesn't really reflect the advances in human creativity, but it was the case that for every dollar that was spent on the space program, 10 to 14 dollars were generated back into the economy. And people know some of the spin-offs, the, the lasers and new ways of treating food and medical things and everyone thinks of laptops and cell phones and microwaves and so, I mean it was just an incredible driver of the whole economy and the standard of living. And it caused a huge freak out in uh, the minds of our former colonial masters in London and, and Wall Street. The Tavistock Institute actually said that this was a terrible thing because before you knew it, every man, woman, and dog in America was going to become a scientist. <laughs> And um, what they were afraid of is sort of what happened after Abraham Lincoln's and the Transcontinental Railroad. We had the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia and people from all over the world came and were astounded by the standard of living in the United States and the idea of credit. And you had people everywhere with the idea now of building transcontinental railroads. And our idea as a nation was not to keep other nations in backwardness, but to share these ideas because the world would be a better place if other nations prospered. So think of the horror of colonial powers if Cameroon or Ecuador were going to figure out how to put a man in space. Well, they probably would not be that open to the idea of having someone come in and steal all their diamonds or tell them that they were supposed to produce cheap coca or, you know, or coffee or whatever. And therefore, um, this optimism coming from the United States had to be destroyed. And they came up with a brilliant way of destroying it, which was the Vietnam War. Uh, and because Kennedy was not inclined and was not going to engage in a land war in Asia, he had had numerous warnings from MacArthur and others about that, he was assassinated. 
and his brother was assassinated. And you had also, in between Malcolm X, and you had Martin Luther King in a very short period of time. And although we did land on the moon in 69, we were already taking down the components by which we got there. So that after that was done, instead of going on to Mars and the things that Kennedy had envisioned that we would be doing, it was basically abandoned. And what happened is that the baby boomer generation who were young adults at the time that this whole question of scientific progress and optimism and development of the world was so brutally attacked with these assassinations and the Vietnam War, uh, what you had was people became susceptible to a kind of cultural pessimism, which was what? Rock, drug, sex, and the so-called environmentalist movement. And what is the premise of the environmentalist movement? Well, it's the opposite of Hamilton. Man is bad. Man is a cancer on the planet. And it violates Hamilton's law and even God's instructions <laughs> on economics from Genesis, um, where it was expressed that it was a natural thing for human beings who are creative to have dominion over the, the earth. Um, so now, what do you do if you're not gonna, there's no value on human creativity. Human beings are a cancer. We should only have probably two billion of them instead of seven billion. The planet can't sustain this. Uh, we're not gonna have scientific progress. We're gonna shut down the space program and we're gonna promote a healthcare plan as, as you have with this, um, whatever, the Medicare Payments Advisory Board and Obama's healthcare plan. It's not cost effective for people to live long. So die sooner. <laughs> Die sooner. You know, we can be like the Netherlands where you can't basically hardly find anyone over 80 and now the senior citizens are going around with little cards in their wallet saying, don't kill me. I don't want to die if I'm in the hospital. You know, uh, so, you, so now what's the value? Where is the value? Where is the excitement? Oh, money. Money has now been deemed in this pessimistic cultural dark age to be the source of value. So what was done, even as we were getting this environmentalist attack on scientific progress, the space program, nuclear power, high-speed rail, well, we were deregulating all the financial institutions because you were considered a genius if you could figure out how to get rich by ripping someone else <laughs> off. And so, <laughs> what happened? You had all kinds of deregulation, but one of the key ones was in 1998 when travelers merged with Citigroup and violated the Glass-Steagall Act, the, the separation between the commercial banking, savings and loan banks, and investment banks. And Bill Clinton was under attack that was during the impeachment of Clinton and Larry Summers and Alan Greenspan and Citibank and so on um, basically got rid of Glass-Steagall and it therefore became quote unquote legal for the savings and loan banks which prior to that point had not been allowed to sell insurance had not been allowed to speculate had not been allowed to you know, bundle mortgages and bundle your credit card debt and give you credit cards with 30% interest rates and then sell the interest payments to one guy and the credit card debt to someone else. All of that became legal, legal, quote unquote. Um, so <laughs> what you had was a, a worship of money as opposed to what actually generates wealth. And this is why we're saying um, that the Glass-Steagall Act is absolutely crucial to be reinstated today. You can show my next slide. This is Patterson after we get the Glass-Steagall yeah. Act. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be high-speed rail and you know modern industry. <laughs> Um, and I would urge, Bob will give you much more of a certain very wonderful sense of the historical combat around this city. 
um, and for the Republic, but I, I really want to say we have, we did finally succeed in getting uh, HR 1489, which is a bill in the House of Representatives to reinstate the Glass-Steagall Act. It was introduced by Marcy Kaptur from Ohio, and Walter Jones is so far the lone Republican co-sponsor. We have five other Democrats on board now. Conyers, Jesse Jackson Jr., Lynn Woolsey just signed on. Um, who else? Uh, Jim Moran and Jim McDermott so far. Um, what we need to do is to get Glass-Steagall reenacted and to get it done immediately. And there is enormous, enormous, enormous opposition to this. Obama has said that if it passed, he would veto it. The British Foreign Office told a top economist in the Clinton administration that London would consider Glass-Steagall being implemented in the US an act of hostility because they depend on these bailouts. Uh, and what we understand from our work with these congressmen is that Geithner and Bernanke are making phone calls like crazy to stop anyone they consider likely from signing on. Because what would happen if Glass-Steagall were to be reenacted is not only would all these gigantic banks be broken back down into the savings and loan banks and then insurance and all the other stuff separate, but it would be like giving back $17 trillion of toxic paper to Wall Street and the City of London. You would relieve the federal government of about $17 trillion of debt. And that, if you have a solvent, transparent savings and loan system once again, can be used as credit in the way that Hamilton conceived of it, so that, number one, you could get emergency aid to the states. We could reverse every single one of these absolutely criminal budget cuts. Two, we would have the resources to address the emergencies which are hitting all over the country with the floods and the tornadoes. And we are likely to have a major quake uh, because of the astronomical cycles that we are in right now. We're going through a period of very great solar activity over the, through the next two years. And there's more um, on that we can take up in the questions period. But there is very good reason to believe that we are going to have a quake on the order of nine, either the San Andreas Fault, the Cascadia Subduction Zone, or they're looking at the New Madrid Zone, which is sort of the Tennessee Valley, Missouri. We haven't had anything major there since 1812. But apparently, Arkansas has had a 1,000 mini quakes this year, small, that haven't done any damage. And someone just did a study and found that um, in the whole Tennessee Valley area, only one bridge actually passed inspection during a non-earthquake. So you, it's just our infrastructure is in a horrible state of disrepair. And this would enable you to have the credit to address it. But most importantly, the credit would allow us again to become a future oriented republic with the number one premium being placed once again on human creativity. And uh, therefore, the last thing I want to say is in Patterson, we've had a big fight here in the city council on their passing a memorial resolution to get the Congress to go for Glass-Steagall. And if you know your congressman personally, if it's Pascrell or uh, whoever it is, definitely talk to them about it. They should co-sponsor this thing. Um, but one of the ways we're doing it is we're getting all the cities to pass memorial resolutions saying that the congressmen should support H.R. 1489. And I think Patterson is going to be voting on this at their May 24th meeting. And I would like to invite anyone here who can go to that meeting to go to that meeting. And we should have a line that goes out the door where everyone tells them they have to support Glass-Steagall. So um, that's what I had to say. And thanks, and we'll take questions later. <clears throat>